Hello and welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. Thank you for listening today. I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist, and I'm really excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information, and guests coming soon to help you in your journey in finding peace with food. Today I'm going to talk about a really important topic and something that can be so impactful on your relationship with food in a both a positive and a negative way. And this is your relationship with your mum. So your relationship with your mum can have a profound influence on your relationship with food, your relationship with your body, and your relationship with yourself. And it's not surprising, as usually our mothers provide the very first food in the form of milk, breast or bottle, and hopefully they provide us with the emotional warmth, care and support when we come into the world. We look to our mothers, as we do our fathers, as our role models and primary teachers. We pick up on our mother's moods, and from our mothers we learn how to care for ourselves, through how we are shown care. Now this is not a podcast to criticise mothers. I'm a mum of three and I know that I often don't get things right by any means. And as mothers, we are all dealing with our own stuff and we generally are trying to do the best that we can at the time. So this isn't about criticising or pointing the finger. Rather, it is to provoke understanding, insight and self-reflection. So I'm going to talk about three ways that your relationship with your mum can influence your relationship with food. And I'm going to start off with diet culture. Diet culture, it's toxic, it's pervasive. We grow up unconsciously taking in all these messages about needing to be thin, to be attractive. We often internalize fat phobia and we often begin to moralize food as good and bad from so young. And these messages are often relentless, they're often unconscious, and understandably they're so impactful. Now I think dieting has been around for a long, long time. Thankfully, Gen Z and millennials are the generations who are really starting to challenge diet culture. I have been so impressed and inspired by so many people who come forward and challenge these old updated messages. And just on Instagram alone, you can see so many positive messages about promoting health at every size, challenging fat phobia and thin idealization, and encouraging body positivity for everybody. And there's also now so much more real sharing. I know there are a lot of perfect manipulated posts too, but also many people now do post without their makeup. They're talking about their mental health. They're talking about the reality of life and imperfections. Whereas in the past, the front was often just professional and polished and the illusion of the perfect body was rife. So this challenging is still relatively new and sadly dieting is still largely accepted to be a normal part of life. It isn't even questioned. And I think our mother's generation often grew up with the dieting messages drilled firmly into their mind. Now some examples of this with different clients that I've worked with over the years. I know that I've worked with clients who would go along with their mum to Weight Watchers from a young age. Now this was kind of seen not as a negative, but as a bonding experience. And you know, they would, as a young teenager, be going along, having the weigh-in, mixing with everybody else, talking about weight, getting really focused on food, um, at such a young and vulnerable age. And for some people, they weren't even actually going to the classes themselves, but the children would run around outside with other children whilst the mums were in there doing their dieting thing. But you can see as well, these kind of messages are quite toxic and we can so early begin to think that this is kind of like a normal thing that people do. I work with clients as well whose mothers didn't ever sit down at the table to eat a meal. 
rather because they were dieting, they'd have their shake in the kitchen, maybe earlier on than when the children were eating. And because they were sort of so unsatisfied by these dreadful shakes, their mum would then be snacking on chocolate and crisps throughout the evening. So quite confusing messages around food and also not modelling a very healthy relationship with food. I've worked with clients as well who vividly remember their mum looking in the mirror and criticising her own body and pointing out the flaws and imperfections. Sometimes as well, mums would be asking, you know, their daughters or sons, you know, how do I look and wanting reassurance. And I think in these situations as well, the mothers didn't have the idea of what the messages that they were passing on. They didn't realise the damage that they were doing. I've worked with clients as well whose mothers would ban certain foods, making them forbidden, as we wouldn't want these foods in the house in case they binged on them themselves. And they'd also have the fear that their children might start to binge eat or overeat on them too. With the pressure from public health around obesity, it's no wonder as well that parents become scaremongered about feeding their children, and particularly as well when they've got their own issues with their relationship with food. So as a child, when you're surrounded by all these diet culture messages, you're like a little sponge. You innocently absorb all the messages around you, both helpful and unhelpful. And if the backdrop to your childhood was one with messages about bodies not being good enough, foods being labelled in a black and white way and often associated with guilt, observing other human beings drinking shakes and banning foods and not having meals, well of course you're going to have absorbed some of these messages and kind of think it's normal. Dieting and body bashing may be also unconsciously ingrained into your mind and it's a challenging unlearning process to shed off the years shed off the years of conditioning but alternatively you might have had a mum who was had good self esteem who promoted intuitive eating and celebrated herself and you independent of body size and if you had this what a wonderful gift this is because this is something that you will carry with you through your life but whatever you experienced, we can have compassion for our mothers and appreciate that these messages were often unconsciously passed on. And we can get our own heads above the parapet with better awareness and understanding of the toxic messages of diet culture. So we can hopefully influence future generations for the better. So moving on to point number two, emotions. So you might have come from a more difficult and challenging family setting where there was trauma, abuse, neglect or over control. And if your mother was parenting in this set setting or if she was actively causing some of this negativity herself, then it's understandable that it was going to have been really hard for you to have got your needs met. And if your mum was struggling with her own mental health, understandably she would have often been distracted or low and not been able to engage with you fully. She may have been doing her absolute best, but it would have been a struggle. She would have battled to deal with her own emotions in a healthy way, let alone yours, and she might have felt really overwhelmed or stuck in her situation. You might have come from a loving and kind family where all your material needs were provided for. This doesn't also always mean, though, that your emotional needs were fully met. This can sometimes be a bit confusing because you might think, why am I struggling? I have nothing to be upset about. Everything was just so great for me as a child. In, a, in what we look for in parenting is the good enough approach. And what I mean by good enough, because there is no perfect parenting, is where you have space, opportunity and attention for your emotional needs to be acknowledged. So as a, as a child, if you are feeling sad, angry, anxious or alone, it is helpful to have a present adult who can validate your emotions. This means someone who can help you name how you feel and then deal with the feeling in a healthy way. So, for example, if I'm feeling sad because I fell out with my friend at school, it's helpful to be able to cry and express the upset or loss. The parent can then soothe the tears and sit with us through the discomfort. They could help me talk about my feelings, distract temporarily if needed, 
reframe the outcome and help give a wider perspective or hope that everything is going to work out. But this doesn't always happen. Life is busy. Parents are working. People are trying to keep the house going. There are relationship blips. There are pulls from the wider family. Issues going on with siblings. Life is hard. So sometimes, even in quite a caring family, emotional needs get missed. Now, if you've had a lot going on in your family, you might have also become quite good at hiding your emotions because you don't feel that you want to burden others or add to the load that they're already carrying. And if you're a sensitive person, you'll be very tuned in to the feelings of others and will intuitively pick up on how they're feeling, so you might actively not wish to cause them further distress. So what can go wrong in families with dealing with emotions? So if your feelings aren't validated, this means that your feelings are not heard or taken seriously. So if your mum just told you to snap out of it and the other people have it far worse, you might feel that you're making a big deal out of nothing and that you shouldn't feel this way. Maybe your mum couldn't deal with your feelings because if she had too much on her plate, she might have felt completely overwhelmed And if you got upset or angry or anxious, in a way, this was just too much for her to even be able to deal with. So it might have meant that she would respond in a really emotional way. You know, she might have got very upset herself. She might have got angry. She might have become anxious. Now, if this happens with a parent, as a child, you don't want to end up having to support your mum too, your parent too. So what you tend to do is kind of shut down your feelings because you don't want to add to the level of distress. You don't want to be a burden. You don't want to have someone else to have to take care of your feelings when they're struggling. If your mum gave advice or a solution rather than hearing your distress, this can also sometimes block you being able to talk about your feelings. So say, for example, if she said to you, why don't you just be positive? Or, oh, if when I was in that situation, this is what I did. Now, sometimes advice can be helpful, but often, if you think about it, when you're feeling sad or low, you don't really want someone to tell you what you need to do to feel better. You need someone to be there with you, accept the feeling, and get in the hole and sit with you for a bit. Your mum might have also been just too busy to even notice when you were struggling. So then your emotional needs would have been neglected or ignored and you would have just very much carried on dealing with things on your own. So the problem with emotions is if you have no space to feel, what happens is then you might end up finding ways to cope and feel safe that aren't so helpful. So you might turn to a range of different strategies to help control your environment. And this might be through checking or rituals in some situations it could even be self-harming and often it can be played out in your relationship with food because we know that restricting can suppress emotions binge eating soothes or distracts from emotions food can be a turn to and a plug for an emotional void it softens loneliness distracts from sadness and soothes anxieties it can be a temporary way to achieve comfort and care when you're not getting this elsewhere so reflect on this What was it like for you as a child growing up? How did you deal with your feelings? How did your mum deal with your feelings? Reflect also on the wider family. It can be very protective sometimes if we have close fathers, grandparents, aunts, uncles or siblings, even if our mum is not emotionally present. Moving on to my final point number three, and this is about early messages that you received around food. Now, We all have a lot of messages that we receive in our family and some of these can be really positive and helpful and can be linked to all kinds of traditions and celebrations and really lovely things. Um, But sometimes as well, the messages are not so helpful and can be kind of detrimental and are just being passed on really without being questioned. And messages as well are often passed from generation to generation, again, often unconsciously. So particularly for parents who were brought up brought up after the war their parents had instilled messages about not wasting food always clearing your plate sitting at the table until everything had been eaten now not to say that this food should be wasted but sometimes if there was a lot of control and pressure around food you know when you weren't very hungry this doesn't really set 
you up for a good relationship with food and to be able to eat intuitively. So did you have to clean your plate? Were you allowed to eat snacks? Was food used as punishment or reward? If your mum was worried about her own weight and body shape, she might have also worried about yours. She may have instilled rules and control around food with a fear of you becoming overweight. You may have learned to call foods good and bad. You might have started to feel guilty for eating certain foods. You might have started eating in secret and feeling bad for eating certain foods. And you might have felt deprived of foods that your friends were allowed to eat. So when you went to a party with your friends, you would overeat massively to make up for the deprivation. I know that I grew up very much with sweets being a reward and gesture of kindness from my grandmothers. And they would regularly shower me with bags of sweets, which as a child I happily chomped my way through. Definitely in my early adulthood, I had an incredibly sweet tooth and always associated sweets with reward and soothing. And this is not to say that sweets shouldn't be eaten, but I guess it's finding the happy balance with food and not relying on it as your primary feel good and pleasure. I also remember my younger sister sitting at the table for hours and not eating her food. And I remember how much tension and drama this created around food. Mealtimes became a war zone. Food became very linked to control and a way of making a stand. And I know that hasn't helped her relationship with food in the long term. But having talked about the negative side, you may also have some really positive food messages too. You know, maybe traditions and rituals that were carried on in your home. There might be a dish that your mum always made or a special cake that you then replicate yourself today with your own family. So think about your own food messages. Which ones do you want to keep? Which ones do you not? So in summary, our relationship with food is greatly impacted by our relationship with our mother. And this can be good and it can be bad. And it's not black and white. It can be many shades of grey too. So in summary, diet culture has a big impact. Often our mothers are carrying these unconscious messages from so young and they pass them on to us. But thankfully, we can stand back and begin to challenge these messages now. And hopefully we can do things differently for future generations. Secondly, how our mother processed her emotions and how she was able to respond or not to her own emotions. This can massively impact your relationship with food. But thankfully, as an adult, you can learn new ways of coping and you can learn to self-parent and self-soothe in more constructive ways through kind words and also through actions that are beneficial to yourself rather than turning to food. And finally, food messages at home. What were you taught around food, helpful or not? Which messages do you want to keep? Which ones do you want to throw out? As an adult, you get to choose. So have a ponder. Think about what's relevant for you and what isn't. And if this episode has brought up some difficult themes for you, you might want to think about exploring this further in therapy. So if you're not following me already, do seek me out on Instagram at The Eating Disorder Therapist. And for regular tips and insights into overcoming disordered eating, do sign up for my weekly articles on my blog page at rethinkyourbody.co.uk. Thank you for listening and I look forward to sharing another podcast with you very soon. Bye for now.